So yeah, my name's Ruin. I'm a recovering video game developer turned data engineer, and I'm gonna speak a little bit about how we build scalable Shiny applications to use in the context of product development teams and how that really empowers those teams. So often when it comes to an organization, we find that data scientists are actually the people who are responsible for introducing a data culture in the first place. This is particularly true if that's an environment where data has not really been used very much historically, if there's not been much tracking of things. And one strategy for doing this involves making data accessible to the teams across the organization, making sure it's really tailored to them. A great method of doing this is internal dashboards, because you can expose data to teams at exactly the right layer. You don't, you're not exposing data that is too raw, but you're also not over-summarizing your reporting to the point where it really just doesn't, it's you know, inactionable for those teams. And for me, uh, my choice of building these kinds of internal dashboards is shiny, and there's been a lot of great talks on this already. Um, if you're not familiar with it somehow, this is an example of what a shiny dashboard might look like. In this case, this is a demo centered around a product where we've got users who are coming to whatever that product is every day. We wanna be able to look at how many of them are engaging with the product every day, and there's some other options on the left there as well, like we might want to track the retention, you know, see uh, what percentage of players, uh, what percentage of users are coming back to the, to the product every day and things like this. We expose lots of different inputs here. Um, so we, for example, we might want to break this down into users who are new to the product today and perhaps users who are actually returning. Uh, or we might want to segment this by the platform that they're coming, coming to the product on, you know, whether that's Windows or Mac OS or what have you. So one of the key philosophies for us when it comes to actually building these dashboards is that we want to minimize the amount of ETL. If you're not familiar with ETL, it's extracting, transformation, and loading, and it's primarily centered around aggregating your raw data into sort of pre-summarized tables. And we really want to avoid this as much as possible because when it comes to data scientists developing dashboard, uh, dashboards, it really it introduces a dependency on the data engineering side of things Whereas actually we want data scientists to be able to just do all of this, just themselves, just write their own queries running against the database. So this is an extreme, extreme advantage for us, but there is a slight complexity that we introduce here. So because we're having these, raw, these queries run against the raw data set, there's a potential for them to take a bit longer than they would if they were pre-summarized. And in stock shiny, this might lock up the dashboard for other users. So just to kind of summarize the different technical challenges we might face when it comes to deploying Shiny in an organization. Like I've just said, we have the long running, well, potential for long running queries. So we have potentially reactive expressions which could take a, you know, on the order of seconds to run. We might be supporting tens or even hundreds of users all accessing the dashboard simultaneously. We need to find a sort of nice cohesive way for packaging this dashboard up for deployment and actually getting it somewhere to run. Uh, particularly in this talk, I'm gonna cover how we use the cloud for this. And then also integrating with the existing user account system for an organization. So if we don't wanna sort of create a separate list of accounts for everybody that has access to the analytics for a product, it's really important that we can integrate with something that's already there. So for the first part of this, I'm gonna talk about how we solve the problems of having long running queries and also many concurrent users accessing the dashboard simultaneously. And this all kind of falls under the umbrella here of asynchronicity and concurrency. So R is traditionally single threaded and this is a restriction that's inherited by Shiny. And what that means is if we're executing a database query, we can't really do anything in the interim. Our dashboard is just stalled for everybody else and that's no fun in terms of user experience. So the first piece of the puzzle to solving this is something called promises. And basically a promise represents the idea that you will get a value for your operation, but it's not quite ready yet. It's gonna take a little bit for that, to, for that to arrive, so you should do something else whilst you're waiting for it. In a dashboard context, we use promises mostly as wrappers around database queries. So, you know, in the example dashboard I just showed, whenever the user hits the apply filters button or loads the dashboard for the first time, the act of retrieving the data for that plot is a promise. It's a promise that, hey, this database query will return eventually and you'll receive a data frame once that's done. But promises alone aren't actually enough to, sol to solve this problem. So they're a specification. They represent the idea that at some point we are gonna have a value, but they don't actually give us any way of running that um, in some separate uh, process. So this is where futures come in. 
And futures are an amazing package. They're, it's basically a concrete method of actually instantiating promises and fulfilling them. So as you can just see with this sort of simple example here, we just instantiate a little future block. Uh, and inside that, we run whatever R code it is we need that we know is slow and might block things. And then once that's done, we use a special promise pipe operator, which is very similar to the standard Magritte and Deepler syntax, but just with those little three uh, dots inside. And this is the promise pipe. This basically means, hey, execute the next step once this promise is ready and operate on the data inside the promise, not the promise itself. And as far as the ecosystem is concerned, support has been rolling out quite well over the last couple of years. When we first started this whole thing, it was a lot ropier, but it's very, very solid now. Um, in terms of Core Shiny, it's fully supported inside reactive expressions and render functions. There's also um, broad support amongst sort of um, integrations into Shiny, so things like um, the advanced data table package and things like this. So what we have here on the left-hand side, we have an example of the reactive expression that we would use to generate that plot from the beginning. So we've got the usual stuff, grabbing inputs and so on and so forth, but the real interesting part is what happens inside the future block towards the bottom of the reactive. And that's where we actually do the heavy processing, uh, the act of actually retrieving this data from the database, and then at the end of the future, we just simply return it, and that's transparent as far as everything else cares. You can see there on the right-hand side, when it comes to actually using the render function, we, have the, we call that same reactive the active user's data, but then we'd, we'd use the special promise pipe operator again, and then we have a separate block which runs, as we would expect, just do a normal ggplot with the data frame, uh, and that will just be executed one, whenever that query is done. So that covers the initial steps of actually having a Shiny application. So we've got some source code, and along the way, we've probably acquired quite a few dependencies. We, at the very least, have uh, Shiny features, promises, stuff like Deepler, everything like that. So how do we kind of package this up into one real cohesive unit so that we can ship it somewhere? Well, the first part of this is a, uh, is a library called Packwrap. And this basically solves the problem of coordinating and managing all your dependencies for an R project. You have a small manifest file which says, hey, I want this version of this particular package. And this is really helpful as well when you're working in teams in terms of coordinating uh, the versions of packages which everybody is using. Otherwise, that can be slightly tricky when somebody decides to upgrade. And in terms of updating, all you do is once you've pulled latest code down from whatever repository you're using, you just run Packwrap Restore, and it'll make sure you have the correct versions of all the packages that are uh, currently specified. The second problem, which has kind of been touched on in some of the other talks a little bit already, is how do we actually package this up? And so we're going to use Docker. If you're not familiar with it, it's basically a mechanism of packaging up not just your application, but all of its system level dependencies right the way through to the operating system itself. You write what's called a Docker file, and this is just a series of steps that kind of imperatively describe how you build the service, like what actions you take. So these containers, once they're actually built, they can be downloaded, they can be run via a couple of different methods. Uh, you can run them simply standalone on your dev machine. You can just say Docker run and your particular container. Or you can use an orchestration platform. You can use something like Kubernetes or ECS to actually run these in the cloud. And we'll touch on this in just a second. An example of what a kind of pseudo Docker file might look like is kind of these steps here. So we might start off with Ubuntu version 18 as our base operating system. We'd install R and Packrat, which are absolutely necessary for everything else. Then we need to copy our manifest file into that container run the installation process, which will grab us all of our dependencies, copy the rest of that dashboard source code in, and then just note down that we're running on a particular port as well, just for network tracking later on. So with all that, we have, we have that one unit that we were after. We have just one, one singular uh, entity for deploying this dashboard, but we do need to actually get it running and deployed somewhere. And wherever we pick for that, you know, what other solutions might they offer to actually help us with some of the other problems that we're facing? Well, we're going to actually deploy this to the cloud. In particular, in this talk, I'm going to focus on Amazon Web Services. Uh, it's the most popular cloud provider. But this, everything in here would equally apply to uh, Microsoft, um, Microsoft Azure or the Google Cloud Platform or something like that. You have basic services like the Elastic Compute Cloud or EC2, which just allow you to manually request some hardware. 
And these are useful, but sometimes you want to do a little bit less of the infrastructure work. And this is where we look to things like value-add services. So there's the Elastic Container Service, or ECS. And what this does is it allows you to take these Docker, these, uh, Docker containers that you're using and actually orchestrate the deployment of them. So all, we've, all we have to do is first we take this built container image and we ship it onto the container registry in Amazon. And then each of our dashboards just becomes a service inside of ECS. If we need to upgrade this, it's really, really simple. You just push a new version of the, of the uh, container image back to the container registry, and ECS will just roll out the change across all of your instances automatically. In terms of scaling, so we've done a lot of vertical scaling within the process with the futures and promises, but if we're starting to exceed the load that a single machine can handle, how do we scale out past that? Well, a service in ECS can actually have a configurable number of tasks. If you have a static use case, you can just set a particular number of tasks to run. But if you have a more complex situation, maybe you've got particular traffic spikes that come at certain hours of the day, you can actually set your service to auto scale. So you could use sort of a, a CPU usage threshold and then scale up and down based on that as is necessary. And this really allows us to go wide with the number of instances that we have. In terms of some of the additional network infrastructure that's required, so we need to use an application load balancer. This allows us to actually expose this, this dashboard as a domain. Otherwise, there's nowhere to send your users to when they need to connect to it. So they just browse to that URL, and it's there. We also need to lock this down so it's just the authenticated users if we're working inside of an organization. So we're going to make use of another service called Cognito. And this allows us to integrate with an existing user account database. And this also handles the sign-in process as well. So this is like an overview of the whole, the whole request flow for a user connecting to one of these dashboards. So they load the dashboard URL in their browser. This sends, it to, this sends a request to the application load balancer. And this passes the request onto Cognito. Cognito checks the authentication versus the account database. If they're already authenticated, great, forward it on. Otherwise, we just prompt them to sign in via some stock sign-in page. And down at the bottom there, you can see what I mean with the distinction between the service in the abstract, and then you have the little orange blocks, which are like concrete instantiations of that dashboard. So each one of those blocks represents an actual R shiny process running under the hood. And these are all wired up to an actual data warehouse behind the scenes as well, uh, in terms of running the queries and things like that. So one last bit I want to touch on is how this integrates with the data science workflow. So again, it's really, really important that we're not dragging data engineers in to mess up the flow for everything concerning the day-to-day -day work. Um, we re also really, really want minimal latency when it comes to actually deploying these things. We don't want it to take a long time. You know, if a data scientist has a report, a new report or visualization that's ready on the Wednesday, we don't want them to have to wait until the scheduled Friday release to ship that. We just want it to be able to go. Uh, it's also really useful for us to use GitHub and that way, we can kind of have nice code review for all of our non-trivial changes and make sure that everybody in the team has like a, a, good, a good chance to review that and be more familiar with what's going on change-wise as well. So in order to kind of take the data engineering side out of the equation, it's really important that we use something called continuous deployment. So um, this is just a process that's responsible for building and pushing our Docker images automatically. There's lots of tools for this, things like Team City, Jenkins, your company may or may already have one of these. Um, they're all really good for this kind of purpose. And the main point is that whenever you merge a commit into the master branch of your repository, it'll automatically trigger a build and redeploy. Basically, it'll run through everything that I've covered in the presentation so far and make sure that a new version is available to users. And with the, with the sort of ideal setup, this runs in the order of minutes. So it's really, really fast. You can just tell people that you've shipped the new change. So just to kind of wrap things up here, I've kind of gone over um, quite a few different ways of how we might start out with uh, introducing um, this data engineering, this uh, product development culture into an organization. Um, sorry. So this process is really about making data available and making sure that you're kind of meeting your team's uh, needs with regards to what that data is. So we run a small little consultancy for data science and engineering. Um, I work alongside my colleague, Alexandra, who I co-wrote this presentation with. Uh, she's a data scientist. 
And we offer these kind of bespoke data pipelines that uh, cover not just what you've seen today, but also expertise in more of the translating metrics into business requirements kind of sense. Uh, and just really making sure that your team gets the most value out of their dashboards. So if there's anything that you've kind of found interesting, if you just want to have a chat about some of the strategies used here, um, feel free to reach out. Uh, both our names and Twitter accounts and emails are just there. Uh, so really anything if you just want to have even the most casual chat about Shiny or anything in that sphere. So thank you. Thank you, Juan. And any question? Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I would like to ask about um, partially cost optimization on AWS and, for example, assumption that you have to support, for example, 200 users. How do you measure that it is sufficient? Your setup, your framework uh, will support that, uh, that uh, uh, amount of users. Do you use some tools like Shiny Canon or something else? So um, on a very basic level, you can use built-in tools to Amazon like CloudWatch. This exposes lots of metrics for you in terms of the services that are running on ECS. It'll tell you across the cluster min-max average for CPU load, uh, memory usage, things like that. It really depends on the kind of profile that your dashboard has. Um, if you're loading lots of easily summarized data, um, then it's fine. But if you're loading larger data sets into memory, then obviously you'd have more of a push towards the memory problem side of things. So I think the best tooling would really depend on the exact kind of nature of what that dashboard is. For us, primarily, it's usually just about CPU load. Um, but there are definitely situations where that would not be sufficient. In terms of the stuff around um, futures and promises, was there anything other than database functions um, that you found were kind of quite common sources of things that would slow things down that you think would apply to other apps? And did you use profiling to look at it, or was it more of an intuitive type process? Um, on the profiling front, it was pretty immediately obvious when we started running some of the longer database queries. Um, so this just became a general principle that kind of all database access, because it has the potential to be longer running, it just all goes into futures these days. It's just safer that way. Um, as to the other types of things that could be wrapped up by futures, I mean, if you had a dashboard that was really web request heavy, again, you've got that kind of notion of unbounded latency. So you, I mean, unless you have some kind of SLA, you really don't know how long those requests are going to take. So that could potentially be another use case. Again, it does add complexity. But it's worth it in the case where you do have to service, you know, tens or, or like I said, hundreds of users at once. Uh, 